Hey, you are listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ Podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? Got to take care of a few things before we jump into this week's episode. First, our Ramping Isometrics for BJJ program. It is a 12-week program all laid out for you. It's going to help you build strength and cardio in the fastest, safest, and most convenient way possible. This is how James and I have been training for the past year, and we love it. So we put this program together so you can just follow along, and we are certain you will see and feel the benefits that we do. It's only 15 bucks. Just go to grumpyguybjj.com. Click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner, and you'll find it. Next, R3. is This is our K2 D3 supplement. It is a combination, combination of those two vitamins, D3 and K2. These are two vitamins that James and I have been taking for a long time that really help us recover from hard training sessions. And for only 15 bucks with free shipping, you get a whole month's supply. I was going to pull up some studies explaining the benefits of D3 and K2, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence and pretend to be a fucking scientist. I take it. It helps me recover. That's it. So for 15 bucks, check it out. And last, but certainly not least, we have partnered up with Dejitsu.com. They have a ton of awesome BJJ instructionals, and they have hooked us up with a discount code for our listeners. It's Grumpy10. So what you got to do is you go to Dejitsu.com, which is D-I-G-I-T-S-U.com. Find the instructionals you want, throw them in a shopping cart, in the little discount code box, you type in Grumpy10, which is just G-R-U-M-P-Y, and the number 10. One zero. That's it. No spaces. Boom. You get 10% off. You're up and running. They got a nice app you can download on your phone. That way you can take your instructions right to the gym with you. Watch the technique. Drill it. It's a pretty sweet setup. So once again, D-I-G-I-T-S-U dot com. Discount code Grumpy10 G-R-U-M-P-Y one zero. Simple as that. To find all this stuff I just got done talking about, go to our website, GrumpyGuyBJJ.com. Click the drop-down menu in the upper right-hand corner. There, you'll subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates. You'll find links for the Ramping ISOs program, the R3 Recovery Supplement, and then under the Programs and Products tab, you'll find a link to Dejitsu.com. And let's be honest, if you guys can't figure out how to navigate a website by now, there's nothing I can do to help you. So quit fucking around, check it out, train hard, and let's get into this week's episode. You are recording. Rob is recording the call. You can still hear me? Yep, I hear you good. Okay, so. Here we go. We're starting. This is it. This is it. Okay, so. Uh, um, all right, so this is our first podcast via Skype. So Rob is in the great state of Texas at the moment, yeah? Yep, good old Mansfield, Texas. Yes, so we uh, were not able to record uh, extra episode before we left. And that's right, you extended your trip. That's what it is, huh? Yeah, yeah. We usually, we're pretty good about planning ahead and recording extra. And I was only going to go, I was, my first part of the trip was to Michigan. And so I was going to be there for about a week or so, give or take. And about halfway through that trip, I got the hair up my ass to go from Detroit to Dallas and uh come see my brother and his family so here i am I, yeah. a little unplanned so uh so we being that i uh kind of flew by the seat of my pants we had to record this via skype yes yes so uh if it's uh choppy and we get cut off and we sound like idiots because we're talking over each other we'll be back to our normal idiocy next week or you know next episode but uh so um there you go. So there's setting up our, our, our episode today. And so Michigan though, man, yeah, I got to, I was going to ask how disc golf go with your dad. Um, disc golf went good, dude. He seemed pretty pumped. The, the first course we went and played was like real wooded, like what you would imagine Michigan would be. Right. And it was just a small little course. It was only nine holes. It was, everything was pretty short. Dude, you had to have some skills. It was, you know, compared to the disc golf courses in, in Grand Junction to where it's basically desert. Yes. And when you drive, you know, your first throw, you you have barely anything blocking your obstruction. You know, you can pick any angle you want and just fucking throw that thing. 
Um, that is not the case at this course in Michigan, dude. Everything was very wooded, and you had a straight, narrow path, you know, bushwhacked in between all these trees. And so you had to be pretty accurate. So that was a rough first go for my old man. But he, he was he was digging it. And then uh, the next time we went out and played, it was more at a park. It was a pretty nice course. And uh, it was way more forgiving, you know, for the beginner because it was all just big, big open fields. So uh, and actually, I was pretty pumped, man. We got I took my mom out and played, uh, which wow. was it was it was it was like I was glad to get her out of the house, get her some exercise. But I could clearly tell she hasn't thrown anything in probably the last 50 years of her life. So that was a little rough go for her, but uh I think she enjoyed being outside, enjoyed spending time with us. So, hey, she got out and did it. I was pumped. Man, that's awesome. That's yeah. a, that's a bonus. Yep. So, well, cool, dude. Yeah, that's uh yeah, it's funny that throwing thing. If you don't do it, um you go to do it and you realize like, holy crap. It's uh this if I don't know how to do this, this can really suck. <laughs> so i remember my dad man same thing like i took him out like first time disc golf and this was years ago because i actually got into disc golf a little bit when i lived in tyler in texas and there were courses like you're talking about man where it's just like you know a five foot wide lane down between trees and bushes and you know you get off course at all and you're just looking for uh your, your disc um but uh yeah taking him out there and God, i think he like tore his pec muscle a little bit or something like literally hurt himself like to the point that he was you know laid up and had to recover from the injury uh, oh no from, no from just going out and playing disc golf because yeah man your tissues aren't used to throwing and you go out there and start trying to huck something around and uh you find out quickly that oh shit it doesn't work so um but yeah that's cool though disc golf is uh it's a great sport it's if we can even like loosely use that term because almost anybody can get out there it's like playing a the lego games on on uh you know your your uh your, your game system because those lego games don't require any skill you know so you're just button mashing and killing everything in sight and you got unlimited lives but it's still a game, so you can get like your mom or grandma on there, and they don't need to know shit, and they can still feel like they're playing a game and having fun. And uh, I think that's kind of like how this golf is. Like you can get someone out there who's pretty unathletic, and they're like, "Huh, I can throw and walk." So, <laughs> but yep, yeah, yeah, and they, like you said, they seem to really dig it, and, and my dad was really digging it until he lost the disc in the river. Oh, uh, he had his because I had bought him a set, uh, you know, a nice little set of disc. You know, I had the driver, the mid range, and the putter. And he had his driver that, you know, he threw it once good, once or twice good. So he chalked it up to the disc, you know, so that that was his favorite disc. Mm -hmm. And he put that one right in the river. He was pretty bummed. Dang. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that is a part, man. If that's funny, though, that your discs, uh, you can't get too attached to them because you never know. You might have like your best buddy launch your favorite disc into a fucking tree and <laughs> never get it back. So you can't get too attached to your discs. Um, so, but uh, yeah, it's funny, man. I still remember that, dude. You launched my my one shark into a tree that we couldn't get down. And then I had another shark and, and like a couple days later, I'm out there and Kelly's using it and she throws it into the river and... Uh, I was like, man, you gotta be kidding me. This is, I just have to, that was, that was the disc golf gods trying to get me unattached to a specific disc. So, um, that's why I looked at it. But anyways, so, uh, yeah, man. Well, I got some news for you. I know you kind of know this. I was hoping to spring this on you completely surprising, but I know Nate kind of fucking ruined it a little bit. But uh, your one wheel tried to kill me the other day, dude. Yeah, I did. I was very interested to hear what happened, and uh, I I was waiting to ask you because I figured it'd be good podcast material. Because all the only text I got from Nate was, he he I think he phrased it in a question, 
He's like, so did you program your one wheel to try and kill James? <laughs> Dude, I was laughing my ass off, and I just responded to him. I was like, no, James just doesn't know how to ride it. But I was very curious, and I, I've been waiting to hear this story. Oh, man. So, yeah. Um, so just like, you know, I you know, riding around. I mean, shit, last episode, I was talking about how much I love him. I was going to get one and, and all this shit. And... You know, I felt in talking to you, right, I knew that if you tip it too far forward, it'll go and you can get launched. So as long as you're, you know, taking it easy, I'd never even come anywhere near close to feeling like I was losing control of that thing, you know. So I kind of figured as long as I'm not getting aggressive and trying to see how fast I can push it, that uh, I'm pretty good. So I decided to uh, use that thing to go to the library to do some work. And uh, so I'm coming back home and I was taking a like a backside turn um, off of one street onto like the main street here in Fruta. And I'm looking ahead and I and I think what happened thinking back, I think that as I came out of the turn and straightened out, I just let my weight shift a little too far forward. And man, I just heard that motor wind up. Whee! And <laughs> next thing I know, dude, I am flying through the air and on fucking asphalt, man, in the middle of the street. And uh, yeah, dude, I fucking ate shit. And luckily, I know how to crash. Um, so I rolled out of it pretty good. But uh, and also, luckily, it was kind of a cool day because I had my um, I had pants on. And I had a hoodie with a long sleeve shirt underneath that on. Because, dude, if I had been in shorts and a T-shirt, I would have been shredded. And uh, so, and I broke my laptop because I had my laptop in my backpack and fucking rolled over that. So that was going to be my joke is that I couldn't afford a one wheel anymore because I had to replace all the shit that got tore up and broke when yours tried to kill me. <laughs> and so, so anyways, um yeah, dude, it tore up my everything I had on got tore up and it, it was a fucking mess. But I jumped up, you know, the old like, whoa, OK, I'm still like walking here. And this old couple comes up to me and they're like, are you all right? And I'm trying to play it off, you know, because I'm all embarrassed. I just want to get the fuck out of there. And uh, I was like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm good at crashing. And and uh, <laughs> yeah, dude, but rode it home and. Um, there you go. That's the story. Yeah, that will, uh, that thing will fuck you up with the quickness. I had, I had a similar Ooh. experience when I first crashed on it and I was getting a little cocky though. And, and I, I can totally see why it happened. Yeah. Uh, but once that does happen, you become very aware of your weight distribution on it because you, you get catapulted. When, it, when you lean a little too far forward, it is it is frightening how how far that thing will launch you. Launch, man. Yeah, Dude, it's a straight launch. It's a design flaw. I will say that's a design flaw. They need to figure something out to where if like where it senses it, if it's tilting too fast or if it if it goes past a certain point that it shuts off or something. Because like I wasn't going that fast. You know what I mean? And if it had just like you know, the front end had just dug in and I had just, you know, gotten launched doing the speed that I was, it wouldn't have been that bad, but it fucking accelerated. And then, then it augered into the ground and launched me through the air. And, uh, dude, I can still hear that sound, that wait, <laughs> <clears throat> motor wind up, man. It's like something from a nightmare. And, uh, yeah. So <laughs> anyways, dude, that was my one wheel crash experience. It was a little, uh, what was really unnerving for me was I can't, I, I'm pretty sure I know what happened, but dude, like I had to think about it. Like, I, like I was really confused about what the fuck happened and why I crashed. Like I was a little scared to ride at home because I, I wasn't, I was like, dude, is there like a malfunction in this thing? Like what the fuck is going on? And, uh. But yeah, as I think back to it, I think that's what it was. I was just kind of coming out of that curve, that turn, and and got a little uh, heavy on the front end when I came out of it. But uh, 
yeah, it was, um, it was, uh, it woke me up for sure. So <laughs> I got fucking all bruised on the side of my, I had to take like a week off of jujitsu to let my, uh, scabs and shit heal up. So <laughs> anyways, it's, I, you know, I, I was using the same line of thinking when you said you think it's a design flaw. And I started, I, cause after I ate shit, the, the, I was you know, like you said, I thought the same thing. I was like, okay, I need to figure out what my actions like. How did I cause this? Because I, I need to not repeat this. This was pretty scary. This could be bad. And so I started doing some digging. And I did a little research, and there, the board, if you pay attention to it, the board does uh, like talk to you. It, it, there's a thing called pushback. Like yeah. If you, if you lean a little too far forward. Or if you start doing some, there's a couple other things that you can do, and it'll actually push back and it'll let you know that hey, you're about to get fucked up. But if you're not tuned into that reaction, because yeah. it, it, it's it's subtle, it's very subtle. I liken it to uh, a float tank. When you're in a float tank, they have a, a timer set, you know, like a sensor deprivation tank. And they, it just creates a little wave in there to wake you up and let you know, hey, your session's over. You got to climb out. You can't lay in this thing all day, right? But yeah. if, if you're not tuned into that little wave, you don't sense it. And you will, if you fell asleep, you'll sleep right through it. It's the same thing with the, the one wheel. It's a slight little pushback. And if you're, not, if you're not paying attention to it, you don't realize it. And if you push through that pushback, that's when bad things happen. And, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it, it's very, very minute and it is definitely sketchy. So that is why you should always wear a helmet and all that shit. But I'm really, I'm bummed you broke your laptop and shit. Like you totally broke it. Like you got to buy a new one. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, of course I don't use a high powered laptop or anything. So in today's world, it was a $150 mistake. You know, I just got a new, uh, um, Chromebook, because that's really all I need. Um, but uh, yeah, dude, it was in my, I will say that Duluth um, computer bag that my mom got me for my birthday, it, it doubles into like a backpack. <clears throat> that thing's tough as fuck. That thing <laughs> just it took it and uh, yeah, you can't even tell. It, it didn't get tore up at all. I wish my whole body was covered in that shit. But um, yeah, no, dude, I, I uh, shoulder rolled and uh it did broke the screen pretty good on the on the laptop but yeah it was uh dude it was it was fucking humorous that's yep. uh <laughs> yeah I, that's- I did this i did the same thing I, although my expa or mistake wasn't quite as expensive um you know i ate shit bruised myself up pretty bad and i did tear a hole in my my loki sweatshirt you know, Loki is kind of a Colorado thing for those people listening. You know, one of those sweatshirts that turns into mittens and whatnot. And yeah. I, mine was kind of new at the time. And that was like a $100 sweatshirt. I tore yeah. a hole in that thing, man. I was pretty fucking bummed. So, yeah. Oh, no. my I had all my, my nice highly uh, hoodie, $100 hoodie. Had all my fucking Prana pants, like $100 <laughs> pants. Fucking Nike long sleeve shirt. So... Yeah, that was, you know, a couple hundred dollars in clothing and then, you know, the laptop. So, yeah, when I was when I was joking around, I mean, it's, you know, I go on Amazon and replace all the shit for not that much. But uh, I was, that, that was going to be my joke. I'm like, dude, I literally I can't afford a one wheel anymore. Like I, the money I had put aside, I got to buy a new laptop and all these new clothes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, my, my conclusion with it is that if. It is a uh, – if you treat it like it is what it is, you're fine. And what it is is it's like a mountain bike. It's like a piece of, of – uh, you know, it's a recreational piece of equipment. It's not a fun little piece of transportation to scoot around town on. Like that's that's where – if you – that's what I was treating it like. You know, I had a helmet on, but I would never go ride my bike on the trail dressed like I was with my laptop on my back. On my back. You know what I mean? Because it's like, I could crash. I'd be stupid. And so, like, same thing. Like, with the one wheel, like, if I do continue, you know, with it and get one, like, it's that's what you got to treat it like. It's like, okay, I got to put my gear on. Like, I'm going out on this thing, and I could – it's like taking my bike out on the trail. 
and uh, you know, just jumping on it in shorts and a t-shirt to ride it down to the store is fucking just inviting disaster. Um, you know, but that's just my my thoughts on it. You got to get back on the horse. Don't let the one wheel win the game, though, James. You got to get back on, ride it, and Ooh. not be. A- I know, man. I know. I know. I do. I just. I gotta admit, man. That the the risk to benefit ratio is, um, dude. I'm still struggling with the equation there, because man, it is. It, dude, getting launched in the asphalt is like terrible. I, I mean, it, I. It's like there's very few things that are worse than getting launched in a fucking asphalt. You know. Like, even on the trail, I mean, snow, dirt, like, everything else you bounce better off of. So, like, you know, the risk, if things go wrong, I'm going to get catapulted into the asphalt. And so, like, that's a significant risk because there's no, there's very, you're not going to crash on that thing and walk away from it being, you know, you're going to get, something's going to get fucked up, you know, there's no way to avoid it. And so it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I gotta, when you come back, you can fucking shame me into it, but we'll, uh, we'll see. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry you got all fucked up. Yeah. I know you are, man. That was not my intentions. My intentions was the, my, my foremost intention was to get it out of my house while I'm recovering from surgery. So I'm not tempted to write. Fuck yourself up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then my, I think we talked about this on the last episode, my other uh, devious plot was to get you to really like it so you buy one. Yeah. But that apparently has backfired on me, so son of a bitch. It did backfire a little bit, but we'll see, man. I'm not 100%. It, it is fun, man. Like, I've still, I have not taken it out since I crashed on it. I'll admit, I've gone back to being a biker and just riding my bike around, but uh you know, man, I think about it because it is fun as shit. It's fun as hell. But I just got to fucking, yeah, get back on the horse, so to speak. <laughs> but anyways, so anyway. one wheel fucking story update. So, uh, yeah, enough of that. Enough um, of that. So hard, uh, hard uh, topic change here. So yes. since, I've been, since I've been traveling, um, you know, I don't have all the luxuries in my home gym because I got a pretty nice setup at home. Yeah. And, you know, so I've been fairly limited and the exercises. And of course, you know, I got to I got to do some sort of exercise every day. And so I've been doing, you know, ramping or yielding isometrics basically daily. You know, I'll do some other like movement based exercise, you know, you know, like walking lunges and stuff that my therapist has released me to do. But they got me to thinking like, OK, how often should you do ramping or yielding isometrics you know when you're because we always prescribe people like if you're training a lot of jiu-jitsu you really only need to do them you know a couple times a week but in my situation like i can't do really jiu-jitsu at all right now you know you know and all my efforts need to be focused on you know recovery and rehabbing this leg and so i was like how much how much should i do these you know it you know to where I get to the tipping point to where I'm not extracting extracting any benefit from it. So that's yeah, I wanted to give you that question, like see what you thought. Um, that's a good good question. I think that uh, oh man, so because there's so many different things involved. Like physiologically is one thing, mentally is another thing. Because like for you, like doing something uh, on a on a like daily basis. Like you feel like you're doing something, right? So and then and mentally that helps you. If you're not doing something, like you feel like I'm not doing anything. And so I I think the isometrics are like are you you know, are you getting more from doing it every day than you would from, you know, four days a week? Uh I don't I don't know. I don't think so, but I think that just knowing you, um that that I wouldn't tell you not to do it because I think that the mental benefit that you're getting from it is better than any potential negative. And I just, I don't think that isometrics have enough of a, of a negative impact on the body 
to uh especially if you're doing your stretching and mobility stuff too that would be kind of the only thing is um but you're you know you, you do that on a regular basis anyway so because you're just basically replacing the tension that you would get from jujitsu with isometric training i mean is that kind of your thought process yep yep, yep. And, that, and that's exactly you know how most of my training's been on this trip is i do like a 15 to 30 minute whatever the day is uh mobility you know routine and then i'll do um the isometrics is it, kind of the the method i've been using i, I really like it because it, it kind of does simulate all the actions you would get from jiu-jitsu you yeah. know you get, you get a lot you get plenty of movement plenty of mobility and then you're getting the tension so it basically kind of replicates what i can't get you know from you know i'm being a, being unable to train yeah no i think that's a that's a good way it's just it, it just also just kind of keeping the body used to doing something on a regular basis because uh it's funny, like between there's been a few things that have kept me out of the, the gym as much as usual between like my low back. That's right. I fucking tweaked my low back. Randy had me in like a bow and arrow with a body triangle locked in. Dude, it was some ridiculous, uh, you know, choke that only he can get you in. And he was crushing my fucking ribs. And so <laughs> I came out of that and that like open mat a couple weeks ago with my lower back a little tweaked. And so I had to nurse that. And then when it was feeling better and I was ready to start rolling again, I fucking augered myself into the ground on the one wheel. And uh, so I had to take time off to let my scabs and stuff heal a little bit. So, uh, and then I get in last night and I'm rolling. I woke up this morning. I felt like I got run over by a truck. It's like, it's amazing how quickly your body like just starts to lose that specific conditioning and like i guess like work hardening from uh you know doing jujitsu and rolling on a regular basis and so um yeah just trying to do something to replace that and keep your body used to uh you know doing those things is um is a good idea so and that's why it's, it's funny because like it's you know if you're just talking strictly fitness like nah man you're not getting any benefit from that you should you know you should recover bro or some shit but there's so many different other factors involved and you know when you look at the totality of it like what you're doing makes total sense um so it uh but yeah that's where knowing like the the athlete and and the big picture comes in so um yeah and i think that's that's good so you've been just been doing like the uh the yielding isos like the um Oh, fucking the, the Steve Maxwell style, or did you take any bands or anything, or what'd you... I did, I actually, I, I took a couple bands to Michigan with me, and um, so I was doing uh, some yielding stuff there, you know, and also, I'll do like a lunge hold, you know, so I'm not using any bands, but, you know, a static hold in that yeah. lunge position, so that's, you know, a yielding ISO, and then, you know, of course, like the push-up in the halfway down position, that's, I really like that one. And I, I switch it up, you know, it's like one day, like say, say for my press, say, you know, uh, my pressing movement, I'll do the yielding one day with a half a push up, and the next day I'll do the military press with a belt maybe. And yeah. so I, I, I alternate it, you know, just so it, more for my sanity than anything. But yeah. I, I feel that I'm getting, you know, physically it's got some good benefits too to change up the stimulus, you know, make my body adapt to something else. Yeah, and that's what I usually do is uh, do the the like the yielding ones with the bands and stuff one day, and then the overcoming with the belt. And you know, you, the the yielding are definitely harder. Like that's a higher intensity isometric than the uh, the the ones with the belt, the overcoming one. So it's it's kind of a, a natural way to cycle the um, you know the intensity levels there, like alternating back and forth. So. That helps too. I kind of figured you were doing that, and you know, if you were just doing like, no, nah, man, I'm doing just yielding every time, I'd probably not recommend that. So, dude, yielding's. I do you agree. Like yielding's fucking a totally different ball game. Like they're harder, uh, much harder than the the overcoming ones. Yeah, yeah, and I've been doing. I really like a blend of stuff. I'll have days to where I'll have a workout. To where I have some movement based stuff. I mean, of course, I always do like my mobility and stretching 
you know, part of it, whether I do it before or after, or sometimes both. But the actual training part of it, or the workout part, whatever fucking word you want to use, I'll have days to where I blend it, you know. So I do, so say I'll do some squats or some, you know, reverse lunges or walking lunges. You know, I, a lot of it's really lower body based for me right now. I got to get my legs strong again. And then, you know, then I'll do some push ups or Hindu push ups. But then I'll also do some ramping isos, like, you know, so like the deadlift or, you know, whatever I do that day. Like, I mix it in, and I really like those style workouts to where I got some movement-based stuff, I got some isometric-type stuff. Like, man, I feel good after I do stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, um, the, the few clients I've been working with, I've been programming in, stuff like that. I've got, like, a, a ramping isometric circuit, and then, like, a, if you want to call it a circuit, whatever, and then some movement-based stuff. I've actually been doing um, some – I've been getting like using the bands a lot. I fucking ordered a shit ton of them. Um, but I've been using them for, I've been doing like a combination of isometric and reps. And so what I'll do is I'll get the band and say like, you know, your deadlift and I'll, I'll uh, do my deadlift hold the, the ramping ISO or 90 second hold, whatever you want to, you know, call it. Um, and then at the end of the 90 seconds, I'll rest, you know, uh, take the tension off for like, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, just kind of, you know, when I feel, um, like the tension's dissipated a bit and then I'll do five reps with the bands of that exercise. And so I'm not like taking it, you know, to failure or anything that second time through, but like my, my thought process is that, you know, you're creating the tension in the movement pattern and now you're, you're, you know, showing the body, like, okay, this is the full movement. Like we've practiced creating the tension and now we're actually going to practice the movement after that. And, uh, yeah, I've been playing with that the last couple of weeks, but it feels, uh, it, it's, yeah, just kind of mixing that movement with the ISOs feels good. But, uh, I'm kind of curious to see where that goes, man. I think there's something there, like using those bands and, and kind of combining the, the isometric holds with the actual full movement. Um, so see where it goes yeah i've been doing something similar with different uh positions to where i'll do like a shorter isometric hold like i like say i do it for uh the reverse lunge and you know i'll get down into like basically the very bottom of that position and hold it for 10 seconds you know then i'll do the other side for like 10 seconds and then so then I, i'm doing reps and uh the isometric tension of it also so i kind of mix them together again i think that just kind of comes from me being bored and having fucking energy to burn and i'm like all right well, let's try it this way you know and just basically just trying to find new ways to make myself uncomfortable and suffer and so i kind of come up with these half-ass ideas sometimes they pan out sometimes they don't you know <laughs> That's how it works, man. Sometimes they pan out, sometimes they don't. It's, and uh, and I, on that note, though, too, I uh, so I took my dad through um, the. I just started with the ramping isometrics for him, and yeah. and he yeah, seemed to actually dig them. You know, he I bought him a belt, so I jumped on Amazon and got him a, a long ass belt, and he's uh, he was doing them because he he's, he likes to work out and he he's got his little lifting program that he does. And it's kind of like an every other day thing. And I think I got through to him enough. And, he, and why I was there anyways, he was doing the, some of the isometric exercises on his off day. You know, so he, because he doesn't want to, you know, give up his lifting stuff, which is cool. Like he's, he's exercising, so I'm not going to try to change it too much. But yeah. then, he, then he would do on his off day when he's not lifting at all, he would do some of the ramping isos. And he seemed to be liking them. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. No, man, that is, that is good. I mean, they're, they're, they're good to mix in. I mean, I guess that's the, the thing, too, is, uh, you know, it's, you, we talk so much about the, the, the ramping isometrics, but it really is a matter of mixing the isometrics with movement. And, you know, in our case, you know, it's usually jujitsu. Um, but if you're not doing jujitsu, then you're, you know, substituting, you know, exercises in the gym. So, I mean, it's, it's always a, ma a mixture of movement plus isometric training. But the thing is, a lot of times you're getting a lot of movement from your sport. So if you're playing a sport or something, you're getting a lot of movement from it. It's like, what's the thing that you're not getting as much of that you need to uh, address? But um, yeah, man, well, that'd be cool. He'll probably uh, be 
interested to hear if he sticks with it and and what he uh, kind of results he sees from it. But, yeah, that'll yeah, be that'll, that'll be the tough part. You know, like you and I have talked about before, is the actual sticking with it. You know, you, being that you and I learned about him together and we you know, keep each other accountable, we we stuck with it. And if you're just doing it by yourself, it's not exactly sexy or easy. And so the odds of someone sticking with it is you got to have some uh, some discipline and some resolve to to keep doing it. So ho- hopefully he does. Yeah, I know it's funny. Everybody's around you going, come on, don't you want to swing this kettlebell? <laughs> You're doing that all wrong, man. You're supposed to be moving. But uh, yeah. No, that's cool, man. Sounds like you had a good trip, man. I got you, you and your dad got to spend some some good time and uh, do some cool stuff together. So that's uh, that's awesome. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good to see family, man. Yeah, I don't get to see him very often, you know, being that I live so far away. So it was. Yeah, no complaints, man. I nice. go there and try to get everybody healthy and get them on the right track and not be too much of a zealot and piss everybody off, and then leave and <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh that's good yeah man i've been like the um with the bands um dude, i've been getting using them a ton and i'm really i like them as a training tool I, I think we've talked about it before like just the the weight is more alive than you know like a dumbbell or even like a kettlebell like you're, you're constantly having to keep your the bands under control they're constantly you know, pushing and trying to fight you if you, you know, aren't uh, producing good tension. And so, uh, but I've been using them a lot for stretching. I got in back into that because like when my lower back got tweaked, I started using the um, the bands where you get like a couple big bands, um, you know, like one wrapped around a bar and another one wrapped around that. So you got like the two, like one super big long band and then get it wrapped around your armpits and start stretching out your lower back and, and all that. And Oh, I feel so good. And I just, I started using the bands for uh, just getting a whole little stretching program on it. And again, it's one of those things that I know about and I've used, but I just for, don't know why the fuck I got away from using them as much. But man, for mobility work, bands are like fucking magic, man. Like they're so much better than just regular stretching. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you got any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I've kind of followed the same path. I used to be balls deep in using the bands for stretching and mobility. And then for some reason or another, I couldn't tell you why, I stopped doing it. And then you kind of forget about it. And then for some reason, you stumble back onto it. And you're like, oh, these are so great. And yeah, I've kind of, I haven't got back into it a ton, you know, as of recently. Yeah. But there, there's, there's a few things I do with the bands or my belt. Uh, as far as stretching goes that I really like. Um, I have, Like I say, I haven't got serious with it again yet, but they, they do, they're a great tool, and they're not terribly expensive either. No, man. I've actually been dicking around on Amazon, and I found uh, a mace, dude, a 10-pound mace for $27 with Amazon Prime free shipping. Really? Yeah, dude. It's the, the, the Apollo Athletics mace. And so you can get a 10-pound mace for like $27, $28, and uh, the bands I've been looking around, and you can find a set of three to four bands, you know, ranging from like the half inch up to like the, you know, inch and three quarter or so um, size and for like 30 bucks. So you can get, and then you throw in a fucking jujitsu belt, you know, grab you a Sanibel A4 white belt for 10 bucks, and you've literally got all of its free shipping on Amazon Prime, and you've literally got everything that you need. For a kick-ass home gym, uh, for like seventy-five bucks, man. Yeah, yeah. And there, there's, yeah, then to do that, there's no excuse why you can't get that, have the whole setup, and not be using it, and not get a good workout in. No, dude, grab you like another cheap-ass ab wheel, and you know, I was like, fuck, dude, that's that's all you need, and I'm totally, I'm all like convinced man that there's something like the bands and the maces you know and the isometrics in general um are like it's just yeah I'm, I'm all about them right now so i've been like fucking experimenting like combining bands with mace movements like especially like 
like the the mace deadlift you know because like the mace deadlift is great but what's kind of the problem with the mace deadlift is i mean we're just being honest it's hard to really load it it's not that heavy right, right? right. but you start throwing some bands on it and like oh well we can load this fucking movement and uh so yeah i've been been trying to play around with some some combination of things there but uh yeah, the bands are fucking awesome. The stretching, and then I've had Shiloh using them for strength training, and again, just watching her, you know, she's, uh, I don't know, you, you know, you can just, it takes a while for people to get the body awareness needed to be in the right position um, without a whole lot of like coaching, you know, like oh, you know, you stop leaning back, you know, watch your balance here, keep your shoulders down. And then, you know, I'm having her do exercises with the bands. And like I said, the bands are just forcing her to be tight, to keep good posture, to, you know, move the right way in, in ways that like, you know, kettlebells and fucking dumbbells and regular weights and even like body weight training kind of doesn't. And so, uh, um, yeah, that's the, my new, my new fucking frontier, dude, banded <laughs> training. So... But yeah, it's so cheap and it's portable. Like I said, like you're traveling with your gym right now. Yep. So, yep, a few belts. I, I took three belts in my jiu-jitsu, or not belts, uh, three bands in my jiu-jitsu belt. Mm -hmm. And that's all I've been using the past couple of weeks, and it's more than enough. You know, you combo that with body weight stuff and some mobility stuff, and I'm good to go. Yeah. Heck yeah, man. Throwing like the glute loop type thing and, uh, you know, the fucking the hip band. Or whatever. Yeah, the, yeah, I'm pissed. I can't, I can't believe I forgot to throw that in my bag. Right, but see, you would have. If, yeah, you throw in that little thing, and it's like, fuck, dude, you got to kick ass workouts forever with that combo. Yeah, dude, I've been I've been kicking myself in, in the ass all week, or past two weeks, that I don't know why I forgot to throw that in my bag, because I use it you know, very regularly at home. And I, yeah. and I took the time to make sure to grab the bands I wanted, and of course my belt. And I remember when I got to my folks' house, you know, the first day or two, and I was like, ah, son of a bitch. You know, why why didn't I throw it in there? I just kind of spaced it, but oh well. Yeah. Yep. No, man. Good uh, good stuff. So, uh, but anyways, there's my my band uh, rant. I'll be talking more about it. But yeah, dude, get you in the – can't wait to get you in the garage and show you some of the shit I've been playing around with, which I'm sure – it's funny. I, I was looking at banded training. You just said it. I was thinking like, man, this is like closed guard. This is like that really cool fucking awesome thing that like I keep coming back to going like, why did I forget about this? Why do I keep getting away from this? And uh, and then you get, you know, lured by fancy new stuff. And then next thing you know, you're like, God damn it. Like, why did I get away from closed guard again? But um, anyways, it's kind of how bands are. It's my jujitsu analogy. Nice. I'm the, on the jujitsu front. You and I kind of talked about it the other day. Uh, I so I went and watched the Uriah Faber. Um, what's his face? Little Ryan, Nikki Ryan. Yes, yeah, I watched well, it too. I, yeah, yeah, I went and watched their match, um, and saw how rough Uriah was being with him. And yeah, you could tell he was getting frustrated. It was basically the whole cyborg Gordon Ryan thing, you know, played out on just two smaller people. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it it, it looked like it to me. It was funny, man. You could totally see after that first uh heel hook that nikki almost got him in like man he came out of that just firing like he was pissed that uh he'd almost got caught in that and uh yeah yeah it's an interesting tactic the uh the the aggressive blurring of the line between combat jiu-jitsu and uh regular jiu-jitsu yeah and i i was thinking a lot about it because you saw Cyborg get frustrated, so he just straight up trying. He tried to do some super aggressive forearm, you know, cross faces and collar ties. And then you know, Uriah was, he got frustrated and was basically like palming him, you know, and like slapping him for the most part. You know, they weren't even, he wasn't even trying to disguise them as a cross face or a collar tie. He was just like fucking stiff arming him in the face like he yeah. was running back you know like it was uh, it was pretty aggressive and i started thinking like why because i i agree man when you get somebody that's playing like a super heavy leg lock game like it can be frustrating it, it'll agitate the shit out of you and so then i then i started thinking why is that 
And it took me a while, man. It took me a bunch of thinking to figure it out. But I think I figured it out is because most of jiu-jitsu is you, you know, you are, you are battling with your opponent to get to a dominant position. You know, because that's where the old school, the point system came from. And the sport of jiu-jitsu is the point system is designed to reward the guy who gets into the best position to where if it was a an actual fight where you can inflict the most damage and you're, you're in, in the safest position to where your opponent can't inflict damage, right? I mean, that's the whole point system. Like, you pass the guard, that's three. Yeah. Neon bellies, two. Mounts, four. You know, back, back mounts, four. Because though it's just a progression, if you're in those positions, you can cause the most damage and you're get safer and safer as you go. And so that, the, you know, that's the mindset that a lot of guys have. And when you get someone that's just willing to sit on their ass and set traps for you as you're trying to pass and attack your legs, they, they aren't necessarily playing the same game you are, right? They're, they're not trying to get into an advantageous position from a combat standpoint right and so it's fucking frustrating right. yeah it's so you, it's almost like you're playing two different games they one person is trying to get into a very advantageous you know fight position and the other person is you know they're still trying to attack and do some missions but they're doing it from a position that might would probably wouldn't be advantageous if there were strikes involved and, and I, I really think that's what frustrates people is because you're basically just playing two different ends and, and those games kind of nullify each other. You know, if you're, you're the aggressor on top trying to pass, you got to be very rare or very wary of where you're putting your legs and where the, you know, the inside control is and what controls they have, because you can get yourself into a whole lot of trouble real fucking quick. If, if someone's content to sit there and just attack your legs. And I think that's where the frustration comes from. What do you think? Yeah. No, man, I, I think uh, I think there's definitely um, something there. It's because, uh, yeah, it is. It's two different games for sure. And it, it, I can see where that gets frustrating if you're like a really aggressive. Because that's the thing, like both the guys that we're talking about kind of employing this tactic, uh, you know, Cyborg and Uriah. I mean, they're both pretty aggressive uh, dudes. I mean, Uriah's team is alpha male, right? Right, so, right. <laughs> so the, uh, um, so yeah, they're you know they come at it from a very aggressive standpoint, and so you you come up against somebody who's like, well, I just refuse to accept your gift of aggression, and in fact, I'm gonna turn it and use it against you. Um, it it can get very frustrating, especially if you come up used to people trying to see your aggression with aggression and and uh you know playing that game so it uh yeah no i i i agree man i think that it's uh it's it's funny i mean being kind of a leg lock guy myself i mean i know it's i can i can see the frustration um with people because it's uh i don't know man it's 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 interesting i mean when you it's not even really the leg lock it's just like knowing your leg entanglements and even if you don't end up getting a leg lock off of it just knowing that man when someone's coming in to pass any mistake of them getting their balance uh, getting off balance and getting a little too high so you can get underneath them and you've completely turned the tables on them and uh it's um yeah it's definitely you know changes how people try to approach the uh um passing your garden stuff but yeah, I don't know, man. I think that I think too. There's there's just the the thing of um, you know hashtag leg locks don't work. And, you know, it's still just kind of that old school like this is you know kind of bullshit uh, way to go about it. You know, like you should be trying to get up and sweep me and pass my guard instead of sitting there just going for uh, for leg locks. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. I'll be interested to see kind of if it if the trend continues because. Uh, I mean, you know, your boy Wagner isn't exactly he, – he's, he's blurred the line a little bit with some of his cross bases, uh, <laughs> you know. So it, it's, it, I don't think it's anything new. It's just, you know, Wagner, I don't think – the difference is, is you could tell almost like with Cyborg and Uriah, they came out with that as their game plan. 
and you know wagner is just wagner and it's like hey man if you happen to fucking eat a hard cross face like that's just you know uh part of the process not necessarily going out saying my plan is to just bully the fuck out of this guy and and you know beat him up and uh you know kind of thing so i could be wrong but i think that's kind of the the difference because you know neither one of us are afraid of a little aggressive jujitsu you know you get a little aggressive every once in a while but there's just those different there's a, like what uriah and cyborg were doing was different and it's uh like you said a lot of that was probably just bred from the frustration they let the frustration get to them so anyways yeah i, I would agree I, I think they come in because both of them kind of play more of a bully style jujitsu, and when that doesn't work uh frustration tends to set in pretty quickly yeah and and it's not and it's more common to just ramp up the aggression as opposed to taking a step back, assessing why you're so angry, and then, you know, coming at it with a different game plan. It's like, oh, a little bit of aggression isn't working? Well, a lot of aggression will work. And just start, you know, blurring the lines between MMA and jiu-jitsu. And, uh, yeah, it didn't really work out. Well, that kind of brings up a, uh, an interesting little subject is, uh, like, what, like, the role of aggression in jiu-jitsu you know, like, because what we're talking about here is like, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, we both agree that aggression on some level, but it can go too far. Like, it can be too much because there is a blurred line. Like, we're not doing MMA, right? Like, we're not doing combat jujitsu. And so there is a line where the aggression starts to, you know, hey, we have sports where you can be that. You know? And so, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. You got any kind of general thoughts on, the role of aggression in jiu-jitsu? Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about it right offhand, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a role for it. It's an aggressive sport. I mean, you're in there trying to submit another human being, so you, you can't discount the aggressiveness, just the nature of the sport itself. And Oh, yeah. I mean, and but it doesn't, like wrestling, like your folk style or freestyle wrestling, um, that sport definitely rewards aggression more than Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu does, you know, with, with the, the rule set and the, the time periods, it, it, that sport's more geared to that, to where Jiu-Jitsu, um, you know, a super high level of aggression isn't necessarily rewarded, you know, and just due to the, uh, the longer time periods for the most part. Because you can't keep that yeah. pace up if you're in a 10 minute match. Like it just, it's just, it's not advantageous. You're just gonna, you can do that for about three fucking minutes, and then after that, then you're spending the next seven minutes, you know, trying to catch your breath and not get your ass whooped. Um, you know, there, there's a time and place for it too, and I think it, a lot of it has to do with your personality. You know, your personality kind of dictates your style of jiu-jitsu and what's gonna work for you. And someone. You know, like you and I have, you know, uh, different personalities and different jiu-jitsu games, and so and you and you see how those uh, those personality traits uh, manifest themselves, you know, in each other's games. So uh, there, there's a place for it, and you just if you know if you, it all comes down to really now that, you know, that I'm kind of thinking out loud, is knowing yourself and knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are, and just trying to. You really just try to disguise those weaknesses and, you know, and express those strengths as much as possible. And so, you know, for me, like being a little aggressive, I, I feel works better for me. But you got to know when and where. You can't just keep going forward because that'll just get you into deep water sometimes. Sometimes you got to back out a little bit or, you know, change the angle a little bit, not just keep pressing forward because that's definitely a mistake I make. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's uh um I, I think the the point about the personalities thing that definitely is uh, uh a good point because there's definitely personalities. It's, it's we've talked about it before. It's like if you don't have an aggressive personality, it's just going to be tough for you to pick up that kind of a game, and uh, you know vice versa. So um, yeah, you know, and again, it's just you know for me, it's you know the it's just 
I don't know why it's such an interesting question to me. You know, like I guess like for me, like I roll with my wife a lot. And, and so I'm pretty, you know, uh, lucky that way. And she's she's fucking really good, like frustratingly good. And so I find myself, you know, having to, I guess, like, you know, uh, it, um, rolling with a girl is kind of a good example. But it's like I hit a, a point with my technique where I know that if I kind of like got aggressive and beast mode, I could probably force this. But is that really a win, you know? And so it's like, like that, so for me, like the, the role of a get blurry is it's not really like, you know, fast paced, like kind of an aggressive um, pace that you're setting as much as it is like, you know, that bully jujitsu, I guess that, that you were, that, that you mentioned, like how often and when and into what volume are you, using that is part of your game because um and again i think that you'd agree that like man if you're just you know smashing your way through uh white belts and women um you're probably not learning and, and like your aggression is actually going to probably hold you back a little bit um you know versus you know learning how to pass without as much you know using the aggression i guess it's kind of like using the aggression is like you know the nas on your technique, you know, you, you got to be fucking hitting that nas button all the time for that extra boost. Um, there might be something wrong with the technique, but, uh, but then again, other people will be like, well, fuck that. And drop an elbow on their face and they'll move, and, uh, <laughs> you know? And so, but that, again, that's where the debate comes in is, is where is that? Uh, what, what is the role? Like what, what is too far uh, with that stuff? But, um, yeah, I guess if you're thinking about it, that's probably the best uh, indicator. Um, if you're not even thinking about it, it might not be good. But, anyways, I don't know. What do you think? No, I, I agree. It, it is something you got to pay attention to. And if you are having to, you know, use uh, an inordinate amount of strength to make your technique work, yeah, it's probably the fact that your technique is flawed. Um, because that's, you know, I think that a lot of people forget that that's not where jujitsu came from. You, you got to remember, you know, Helio Gracie, he was, you know, super small and, and little and frail compared to a lot of the, the other brothers. And when they were learning jujitsu, they were learning it from a big, strong Japanese dude. And a lot of it depended, you know, on someone being pretty physical and pretty strong. And so the techniques weren't working for him. So he had to adapt. He's like, all right, I got to figure out a way to make this work for me because I'm smaller and skinnier than a lot of these guys. And I, I always go back to that when yeah, I see somebody beast mode and things or someone say, oh, I'm not strong enough to do that. You know, I can't do jiu-jitsu or I can't do that move. And no, it, it doesn't require you don't have to be, you know, a superstar athlete or, you know, exceptionally strong to make things work. And, and if you do have to be exceptionally, exceptionally strong to make your jujitsu good, uh, well, let's face it. Your jujitsu is probably just not that good. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd, uh, I think everybody would agree with, agree with that. But, uh, yeah, Fuck, I had something else pop in my head for a second and then it just left me. But, um, so anyways, yeah, that's all good. Hey, Ken, uh, I'm just curious. I got these guys out here mowing my brother's lawn. Can you hear that lawnmower in the background? Is this going to be terrible for people listening? I can't hear the lawnmower at this moment. Okay, that's cool. I did. If it was pretty loud, I was going to say we should fucking wrap it up because I didn't want to. I know the sound quality is kind of suspect on this as it is. We didn't need to add fucking tractors and lawnmowers and weed whips into the equation. <laughs> no, no, no. No, we're good right now. We got a little... We can sort of record a little bit more here, right. but uh, um, yeah, man, no worries there. So, what uh, I did do a little bro science research before I called you. Sweet. So, yeah, man, it was actually it was funny because we were talking about this year two ago, whenever about RPE, rate of perceived exertion, and you were kind of like, that's bullshit, you know, because it's just like subjective. Like, where's the real data? Um, right. kind of thing and you know we talked about it a little bit and I, I know you're not quite that uh anti-rpe but what was interesting is i found 
it was three different studies basically looking at RPE and um, as a measurement for two were for judo and one was for uh, combat sports in general. And the take home message, all three of them found that RPE works really well. There's a very high correlation between um, like one found a, a strong correlation between RPE and, and people's blood lactate. So again, like that, you know, the more lactate you're producing, the, the harder it feels like you're working. So that, that physiological um, measurement actually correlates strongly with that. And uh, what was um, w one of the studies that looked at the combat sports found that RPE works better than heart rate monitoring for sports with a high level of anaerobic uh, contribution. So things like MMA and jiu-jitsu versus like taekwondo, for example. So like for taekwondo, heart rate monitoring will correlate uh, um, better than with uh, jiu-jitsu. And, you know, we've seen that, man. It's like your, 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 your heart rate, uh, you know, it, it's that, that those, those high anaerobic efforts, there's that heart rate lag. That's the term for it between how hard you're working and when your heart rate actually catches up to the effort level that you're putting in. And so like for, you know, more aerobic based sports or, or you know, activities, um, the heart rate is able to maintain that correlation better. But as soon as you start fucking slapping hands and wrestling with each other or doing MMA, uh, that anaerobic side starts kicking in more. And then the heart rate lag um, means the heart rate monitoring isn't as accurate. And so your RPE is actually a more accurate measurement for uh, for those sports. So I just kind of, uh, yeah, there's some science for you in your RPE bashing. <laughs> you know, not that I'm RPE bashing. I just, you know, I'm aware of it, but I'm definitely not very knowledgeable. And I know uh, power lifters like to use it. And hey, that's cool that there were some studies done in combat sports. That's really cool. I'd have to check those articles out myself. I'd like to read it. But I know our fucking buddy Nate. The gorilla Nate is always in the gym trying to be Mr. Powerlifter, and, and I'm pretty sure he uses RPE to design his program, or his powerlifting coach uses RPE for that. Um, so I know there's some merit to it. I just, again, I'm just basically I'm ignorant to it, and so if I'm you know, to it, I'm just gonna, though, I'm gonna man. bash it. You're not, you're not ignorant to it. You do it like you already like. Well, one, we do it in ramping isometrics, right? RP of five, our, you know, we're, we say 50%, 80%, 100%, but you may as well just say RPE of five, RPE of eight, RPE of 10, right? right. Like, so you're, you, you use it there also with your, your daily workouts, man, when you're feeling good and you push it in, in days when you're not, you know, and so like, I just, I know you, you listen to your body and really that's all RPE is, is listening to your body. Which sounds ridiculous, but if you think about it, like we know, man, most people are not tuned in to their body. And so it uh, it can make RPE a little sketchy until people kind of get a better feel for their body, which I think is one of those things that you were kind of alluding to where it's like, you know, give me some fucking hard data because people, you know, somebody could be walking down the street and be like, oh, that's a 10, dude, because they're a pussy. You know? <laughs> uh, but once you kind of get when someone has experience with RPE and they've learned to listen to their body and they can tell you like, yeah, that was about like a seven man or, or whatever. Like I'll bet you, you naturally do that already. Like, and so, um, it's just something you're not as conscious of, but, uh, um, yeah, I think that if you think about it, you, you, you actually use RPE quite a bit in your own training. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I just never put a label to it. And a perfect example of that, um, would be just this Wednesday, I guess would be yesterday. So Tuesday, I had a long ass travel day. Um, I, I obviously don't need to go into all the details, but I would, I ended up being awake for about 24 hours straight. And, and then I got, I got here to my brother's house and I didn't sleep for shit. I, I was running on about three or four hours of sleep on Wednesday, but I still wanted to move and do something like, you know, I still, I still just, I'm make sure I do something every day. Right. And 
but I'm not going to, I would de- definitely didn't try to kill myself. It was very low key. And if I had to put an RPE number on it, yeah, you're talking like anything I did that day was maybe like a 50%. You know, I was not trying to set a world record in anything I did. It was just, yeah. okay, it's like, I need to move. I know I'll feel better once I move. I'm tired. I don't want to. But I know this is the recipe to make myself feel better. And that's exactly what I did. So, yeah, you're, you're right. They, I do I do probably use RPE quite a bit. But I just never refer to it as that. So maybe that's the next wave. Maybe I'll just claim that I'm like an RPE fucking expert. And that's all how I train. <laughs> You're naturally, you're, you're, uh, uh, instinctive RPE. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's funny, man. That's what the, uh, old school bodybuilders would call instinctive training. When you just showed up to the gym and did whatever the fuck you wanted. <laughs> and, uh, but it's funny. Cause they always said, right? Like even then they said like, this doesn't work for new people. Like this is the instinctive training was always something that they said like this. You ha- you got to have some fucking time on your belt and know what's going on before you can just walk into the gym and make shit up. And again, it's just, you know, if you're fucking Ronnie Coleman, dude, like, man, you know, you know where you're at. Although that guy probably didn't use RP as much as he did. Just how much fucking heavy weight can I pack on that bar? But, uh, yeah, that dude's a fucking animal. Um, but anyways, yeah. So RPE, it's good, good measurement. And, uh, yeah, it's not complicated to use and just good way for people to monitor their training. I mean, that's, that's the thing I've always told people. Say, like, man, if you come in, you got a workout plan, right? And you're, it's uh, supposed to be a, a hard workout, but your, you know, house burned down, your girlfriend broke up with you, and you found out that uh, the IRS just, you know, uh, put a freeze on your account and you got no money available to you. Like, dude, that workout, like your mental state is going to affect how hard that workout feels, you know? And so if you just have weights put down, you're like, well, I got to lift this much weight for this many reps. And you're not paying attention to RPE, like that's how you want to use it. It's like well, that's why I plan, but this is supposed to be a moderate workout or a hard workout. And so, you know, if you walk in, it's supposed to be a, a you know hard workout, and you've had a fucking you know great day. You may be able to put in a little bit more effort. So the weights may be a little bit light, or the 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 effort, you know, whatever you had planned. So um, it's really just kind of using that uh, as a way to help guide your training instead of just blindly following numbers because that's where people get in trouble it's just that blind slavish following of like oh man my program says i gotta lift this much weight for this many reps and uh yeah that shit doesn't last long term so but oh i got a new fucking nickname for our buddy nate nice the uh the the genzilla <laughs> the gen are you talking like uh Ging, like ging like oh. genzilla Gingzilla, I like Gingzilla, that. Gingzilla, yes. It's uh, <laughs> we were watching America's Got Talent last night, and that is the name of a seven-foot cross-dressing uh, singer from Sydney, Australia. That is, that is too many things thrown at me in a row right there. A seven-foot cross-dressing. What was the other thing? A uh, bearded singer. <laughs> from Sydney, Australia. It, it was it had the name the Gingzilla. Gingzilla, yes. I like that for name. Yeah, he is now going to be referred to as the Gingzilla. Yes. <laughs> well, we got the Ginger Assassin and the Gingzilla. He's got a few fucking nicknames. But uh, yeah, I saw that and I was like, man, uh, that's that's going to be if you don't happen to see it. For some reason, before you get back, that is going to be your next Wilson um, introduction, you know, expanding your your horizons that you never knew you needed expanded is uh, watching that that fucking dude is his uh, his thing um, audition was fucking hilarious, man. It was pretty good. I'm actually a fan of the Gen Zilla. As soon as I hang up with this phone call, I am going to. Hit up YouTube and type in Jimzilla and see what I get. There you go, dude. <laughs> so yes, it's worth a Google for sure. Um, so, anyways, man, that's all I got on my list. I don't know if we had any other topics. No, man. I think uh, I think we should call it. I think uh, that being our first, you know, remote podcast in the history of the Grumpy Guy podcast. Uh, 
think it's a good place to end it. Hopefully we didn't step on each other too much. That's one thing I always, it always agitates me when I listen to podcasts and I hear the phone interviews. It's tough, you know, because the sound quality isn't great and it's really easy to walk, you know, talk over each other and then make it fucking painful for the listeners. So I really try not to. I know I probably laughed a few times or did this and that when you were talking. So hopefully we didn't fucking give our listeners too much of an ear beating today. No, I mean, I think we did good. I was kind of trying to be aware of that, too, because, yeah, you're right. It's uh, um, tough. Sounds like a fucking Fox and Friends panel when it's like five people on the screen trying to talk over each other. And uh, it can be a fucking shit storm. Oh, dude, have you seen Deadpool 2 yet? Um, Man, I think I have. I think I did see yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, I watched it last night. It's fucking hilarious, dude. Those movies are so funny. I don't. Why didn't Deadpool get in on the fucking Infinity Wars? And you know, spoiler alert, the End Game uh, for anyone who fucking cares if Deadpool was part of the End Game. But he's Marvel. He's Marvel as fuck. And uh, but anyways, but no, he had a line in that movie, man. I loved. He goes, "I'm not a good guy. I just do what's right." I was like, "Fucking a, dude." You know, people want good guys to follow rules. And sometimes there's a difference between following rules and doing what's right. Agreed. Yeah, on that note, I went and saw John Wick 3 with my old man uh, when I was back. That's a pretty badass action flick. I got to see the... I, I haven't seen any of them. I oh, see. fuck, dude. Go, you need, that's what you need to do, man. I, I know, I know. It's just hard to find time to watch a movie. So I, uh, I'll i carve it out, but uh, I don't know. One day I'm going to be old and, and, you know, sitting in a nursing home, man. I'm going to have plenty of time to fucking watch movies. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I tell myself. Right on, brother. Yeah, I say we call it there. I also know that with uh, Skype technology, the longer we uh, push it, the more likely it's going to fuck us over. So um, Great. Great. I think we're in a good spot. So, um, yeah, man, it's been fun catching up. and. Uh, have fun rest of your trip and um yeah i guess next week or next episode we should be back to our regular regular live setup sounds good james i will uh you hold the fort down for me man i should be back to good old colorado in a few days and i'll be looking look forward to getting back into the normal routine okay man let me know what you think about genzilla when you get it when you watch it <laughs> all right brother i'll talk to you later okay buddy see ya. see ya Thank you for listening to the Grumpy Guy BJJ Podcast. Thank you all for listening. You can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. It really does help and will allow us to keep putting out episodes. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, hit us up at grumpyguybjj at gmail.com. Also, go to our website, grumpyguybjj.com, and get signed up for podcast updates and get our free BJJ Improvement Starter Kit. That's it for now, so get on the mat, train hard, and talk to you all next week. They shoes, what? no trace of the tools Shaped into face, fuck the rules Snooze you lose One eye always open, it times two No clue, but soon a brief monsoon Might give you a view to choose Stay tuned, include, won't conclude To the end is near beware There's consequences for what you do To me and demon The devil of many levels I keep on beating For several of them rebels Me, myself, he died Myself, he died